A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. We are recording this on March 23rd, 2021, and I am your host, Anna Garcia. Our guest today is Luis Bolaños, a former homicide detective with more than 30 years experience in law enforcement. Now he works as, as a private investigator. Lewis is a personal friend, a partner in crime, a friend of the show. We're so glad that you're with us today because we could really use your insight. Happy to be here, Anna. Thank you. Uh, So this is a special episode of True Crime Daily, the podcast, because we are focusing on one horrific case of a convicted killer. This is a husband who was found guilty of murdering his wife, who was six months pregnant at the time with their baby girl. The man was a probation officer at the time of the murder, and he was found guilty and sentenced to 30 years to life in prison. One would think that we were done with this case, that he would be locked up for a very long time, and the family of the victim would not have to worry about him coming out. Well, as recently as just eight weeks ago, he was about to be set free years before he was eligible to even step foot outside of a prison. He was about to be paroled almost nine years early because of the will of a governor. And the governor did not act alone because the parole board agreed that he was fit to be released. This is an incredible story, and if you're upset, you should be. And the reason he was stopped from getting out of prison, he was stopped by one of you, as I like to say, the angry, loud, outraged chorus. Actually, one of our viewers, Lewis, and and Lewis and I have been working on this case for several months now because what happened is one of our listeners was watching our show and left a comment on YouTube. And this was in December. And she said, you know, if you think this is bad, you should look into the case of my mom. She was murdered and they're about to parole her killer because of the governor's actions. And we were like, what? So we got together with Lewis because it was an extremely complicated case. Right, Lewis? You've got the governor commuting a sentence. There is a parole board and several hearings, which, you know, that generally doesn't get a lot of coverage. In the crime world, no one ever, I mean, in California, think about it. The only time we we hear about the parole board is when a member of the Manson family is about to be released and everybody gets hysterical here right. and across the country, right? Right, right. This, this is a little different, I think, and it raises it to another level because as you described, the angry mob that eventually built up and kept building. Um, and then the involvement of two huge entities that brought it to the forefront. One, we'll talk about in a bit, the California Innocence Project. And we'll we'll get into the type of work they do. If you're not familiar with them, you probably should be. But also, DA, retired DA, Mike Ramos from the San Bernardino uh, County District Attorney's Office. Let's be clear. Mike, at that time, represented the largest county in the United States uh, by population, or excuse me, by area. Now, I want to say it was 14 or 15 by population. That was the lead law enforcement officer of that county. And he prosecuted this case and he stood up and he rang a loud bell. And I think um, that's rare. I'm really interested to see how he got up to that, how that developed. But I think uh, it was a factor from a few different directions that made this really unique and brought it to the forefront. And look where we are now. Yeah. So Mike Ramos, who prosecuted this case, then was the elected district attorney during the appeals process on the murder conviction, actually continued to work to keep this man behind bars. And he did it with the help and the welcoming arms of the victim's family, including her daughter, Chantel Haynes. Now, it was Chantel who left a comment on our YouTube channel back in December. And we started researching it. And at that point, again, we thought he was about to be released. And and it was 
there were so many documents that we had to go through. And we kept thinking, like, has something changed? Because to rise to the level of a governor commuting a sentence to make it possible for someone to be eligible to be paroled after killing his wife, who was pregnant, I mean, that is, and it's such a violent crime. I mean, she was stabbed and she was strangled and the body was posed. It's, it's, it's a it's a heinous crime. Very, very violent. So to have that and then to have the parole board say, you know what? Yeah, he's fit to be released. We're all thinking like, OK, what's happened? What's changed? And that took us a few months. And then while we're in the process of, of reviewing all these records and we're on the phone with the victim's daughter, Chantel, who's going to be on along with Mike. She says to us, hold on, everything's changing because she had organized an online petition. She had organized a letter writing campaign. She and all her family attended the parole board hearing along with the former prosecutor on this case. And there there were a lot of people who were objecting to this guy being released. So what we're going to do is we're going to tell you really do a quick headline, if you will, of what the case is. And then we're going to bring on the victim's daughter, and the man who prosecuted the case and wouldn't let go of it to make sure that this guy stayed behind bars. I'll be very curious to hear what everybody thinks should have happened in this case. So let's go back to the day of the crime, and then we're going to bring everybody else in. We're going back to March 10th, 1997. 39-year-old Deborah Blackrow was found dead in the bathtub of her Highland, California home. She was six months pregnant with a baby girl. She was discovered by her husband, 27-year-old Rodney Patrick McNeil, who was working as a probation officer. He came home during his lunch break. He discovered her. He was supposedly coming home to take her to a doctor's appointment. Okay. The body was posed, and we're going to get into that later. There was a racial slur that was written on the bathroom mirror, and the house had been ransacked. The husband said he thought it was odd when he opened the front door to go inside. He said, why is there ketchup everywhere? I swear to you, these are his words. Ketchup. And he used those same words again in his probation, parole, excuse me, in his parole hearing recently. Lewis, who in their right mind thinks that there's ketchup all over the walls when nobody. they enter a home that is ransacked? No, nobody. Nobody. He, it, it, there's a lot of problems with his, his alibi or the statements he chose to give at the time. Um, I think it, the most folks can tell the difference between ketchup and what a, a horrible, bloody crime scene looks like. Um, and at what, at what point did he change his mind that he was no longer looking at ketchup? That would be interesting when he thought, okay, this is different. This is not ketchup. How did he figure that out? If he ever did. Right. He said he's calling for his wife. He walks around. He finds her in the bathtub. And when he sees her, he freaks out. You know, uh, we'll let the prosecutor tell us the details of whether he pulled the body out of the a tub or not. The little discrepancies there. He says he can't find the phone. He runs looking for the base of the phone, can't find the phone. He runs outside the house. This is his story. Knocks on the neighbor's house. Bang, bang, bang. Neighbor doesn't come out. He runs back inside the house, then runs back out to the neighbor. Bangs even harder this time. Neighbor comes out, calls 911. Now, this happened in just a few minutes because uh, 911 was called at 1232 p.m., right, you know, right after noon. And he says, look, at 1219, I was still at the office because I was making phone calls from my desk. So I couldn't have done it because I couldn't have ransacked the house and have killed my wife in less than 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah. i will be interested to see what Mike says about that. I'm sure all that's been addressed and redressed uh, numerous times. But I, finding every single homicide that we've been involved in, where a loved one comes home and finds their significant other or close family member in the middle of a homicide scene dead on the floor, most of the time the, re the re reaction is to go to that person and pick them up, not to flee and to embrace them and or to see if they're alive at minimum. Um, and in that there usually is some type of transfer, especially if it's bloody. That's not the case here. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that as we get into it. But I find that to be a significant factor that he didn't do that initially. 
that's that's really telling to me. He did not apparently have blood on him or on his shoes or the soles of his shoes, considering, remember, he ran in and out twice. Right. But there was no blood on the shoes or on him. We right. will get to that as well. Here's the other thing that police learned immediately. There was a long history of documented domestic violence in in this household. And so there were holes in McNeil's story. The timeline wasn't adding up. A bunch of things are not adding up. He ultimately gets convicted on two counts of murder in 2000, in the year 2000. He was sentenced to 30 years to life in prison. He insisted the entire time that he was innocent. And he said that it was his brother who did it. His brother is apparently a convicted killer himself who is in prison. Um, we will get to that later. There is so much to this case, so much that is unbelievable. So let's bring in the people I call the warriors, the warriors fighting for justice. We have Chantel Haynes, who is one of Deborah's four children from a previous marriage. Welcome, yes. Chantel. We're so happy you're here. Thank you for having me. And then we have Mike Ramos, who prosecuted this case and then defended against the appeals that came, attended the parole hearing with the family, has been very vocal about this, has never given up, and actually argued with the governor's office. I'm, I mean, these are not your words, but probably your thoughts. They're mine. What are you, crazy? <laughs> Mike, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. So I, I want to say to Chantel, I want to congratulate you on your efforts you honor your mother and your family by fighting so very hard for justice. And you were so young when she was murdered. Yes, I so was on 13, uh, two weeks before my 14th birthday. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, he is behind bars. But what we're going to discuss now is how he almost was released. And he came very, very close to being released early. So l let's. Let's go back, Chantel. Tell us what was going on in this relationship, because um, he said that he had been arguing with your mother that morning, and a few days earlier, your mother had sold her wedding ring, and he was upset about that. What was going on when the murder occurred? Yeah, um, prior to that, um, we were we were young children at the time. I was 13. My sister was 16. And my brothers were uh, five and seven. At the time, my mother would come to Las Vegas uh, from California to you know, visit with her children. And uh, at this time, my sister was having troubles at school, so she had to come to Las Vegas. During this visit, she had informed the children that, you know, this was it. She's, she was done with her the domestic violence relationship, and uh, she was going to end the marriage. Uh, she had told us that she needed to go back to California for a few things and uh, she would be returning for good. Unfortunately, she did not make it back. When is the last time that you saw your mother? Um, it was like that Sunday. Um, if I knew that she wasn't going to come back, if I knew that this man would see my mother as monetary value and uh, take her from us, I would have pleaded for my mother to, to never leave. Um, she was a loving woman. She loved children. She loved her kids. She was teaching us our Lakota language, and she would watch scary movies with us or uh, go to Walmart and get some, like, Fifth Avenues and Sprites and just hang out with her kids. She really wanted to give us a home, and unfortunately, he made it very difficult with his uh, domestic violence. He was verbally abusive. He would uh, hold her contacts and her glasses and her IDs from her. She was legally blind without her contacts and glasses. But I guess he just needed to have that control of her. So uh, I was there to witness this. I had to do an impromptu learn how to drive at the age of 12 to get her around so she can beg and plead from him for him to return her items. 
by the end of the day, they magically appeared. So he, he always had that control over her, control over the car, control over the money. Um, the reason why she had pawned those items was because he cleared out the bank account. So he left a pregnant woman to have to fend for herself in Las Vegas. Uh, she was there pleading with him, please, Patrick, don't make me pawn these items. I need food. I need money for, for food for my family out here. He did not do that, so she she pawned those. He knew that they were pawned, but he decided to say that they were stolen after the fact. Which yeah, is we're going to get into the issue of um, there's all sorts of insurance fraud, which he has admitted to. And, of course, the police also discovered that happened prior to the murder. And then after the murder, he actually claimed that things were stolen in the house when it was ransacked, knowing full well that they weren't. And he filed these insurance claims and some others, which you all will get into. I do want to catch everyone up. You mentioned that your, your mother was teaching you Lakota. Your mother was uh, a member of the Oglala Lakota Sioux tribe, and she was from Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Yes. And so your mother was an indigenous woman and very proud of that, as is your family. And that also will come into play here where um, because of the huge, huge level of violence against indigenous women uh, that doesn't get enough attention either when we will talk about that. So, Mike, I'm going to jump to you now. Sure. And what was what was wrong with his story? T tell us how you knew that there's no way his version was adding up. Yeah. And, and I have to tell you, we, we spent hours and hours. And when I say we, myself and the sheriff's department and the detectives, uh, reviewing every fact of this case before we filed. There were some, and I'll, and I'll tell you, there were some in the off, the district attorney's office at the time. Uh, I was in the major crimes trial unit that said, I'm not sure you're going to be able to prove this. Um, you know, they didn't say he was innocent, but I'm not sure you're going to be able to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt because he did uh, really such a good job of trying to hide the evidence, of trying to um, really throw people off uh, to another angle. But I think in the long run, that worked against him. And that's what I talked to the jury about when we put these circumstantial pieces of evidence together. Um, there's nobody else. It doesn't make any sense that anybody else would come to, um, you know, Deborah's house at that time period when he was supposed to show up to take her to the doctor's house, come in, commit a, he made it look like at first a robbery uh, uh, in, in home invasion, kill her, and then try to clean up all at the same time uh, that all this occurred. Uh, we know uh, that his brother was not in the era, that, that, that never came up. In fact, he first blamed uh, her best friend, uh, Zebra's best friend, um, and never took responsibility for it. We also uh, had a eyewitness across the street, a uh, lady who said, hey, every day at this time at 1213, I come out to get my mail because it's the first break on the soap opera show I watch all the time. And uh, she came out and said she saw his vehicle in the driveway. She had no reason to lie about that. She knew them. They, they were neighbors. And this witness also saw him, thought it was odd, running around in the living room. We had testimony. He was going back and forth and inside of the house. And it was the strangest thing, um, as you indicated before, not calling 911 and going and holding his wife. No, things were falling. Things were moving. Uh, it, it was chaos. Um, and so we took that. We took all the facts uh, of the timeline, the way we had the timeline, and we drove that uh, that time. We had him leaving with probation personnel from the probation department between 12 and 10. The detectives and I got in the car, and we drove that route with red lights, without red lights. We gave him the benefit of, of the doubt of about 16 to 17 minutes, which he could easily commit this crime. Because when he got home, he was so angry. And as you noted, or maybe we haven't talked about it yet, 
right before I did my closing argument, I listened to all the evidence. I crumbled up first degree murder. He didn't sit there and premeditate and plan this. He got home and saw more damage to their television sets, to the home, and he just, he lost it. In, re and in reckless disregard for human life, he began to, we're not sure what happened first, stab her, strangle her, and then as he was killing her, then he had to figure out an alibi. And one of those was, okay, let's make it look like a robbery. So that didn't really work because now you have his, his, um, uh, he's being there, he's being placed there. And so he's thinking, okay, well, let's drag her body over and let's clean this up. And I always thought we could never really prove it, but I always thought he was cleaning it up to take the body and dump the body. Clorox, all these detergents, put her in the tub, clean it, everything that anything that had to do with blood. Um, and he cleaned most of that blood. But then we had our experts come in, the crime lab, who used luminol. And when they highlighted the floors, bam, explosion. You could see the blood trails that he cleaned up with Clorox all the way to the bathtub. And a key, a pair of tennis shoes that he had, that when the detectives first went, they shouldn't have taken him. But when they first went to his house, you've got to remember they're considering him a suspect, but he's also the spouse and the husband and a probation officer in San Bernardino County. They didn't really take, and they admitted this, they didn't take some of the stuff that they should have in the first, you know, when they first entered the home. When they got a search warrant later, those tennis shoes, gone, missing. But we know, thankfully, they took a picture of those because those shoes marked the shoe prints with the highlighted luminol where the body was drugged through the blood walking towards the bathtub. So those were his shoes. Those were the prints. We got him now in the house, his, uh, his behavior, and then we have him dragging uh, our, our, you know, our victim into the bathtub. And it also a crime of, I called it passion, because he started to shave her head. Uh, continue, I believe, to stab, and I, and just, I, I, which to this day I can't believe. You know, you're talking about your own baby. Um, you know, our our victim, and I told the jury, remember, there are two victims in this, and and then he came up with another plan. He wrote uh, on the mirror, you know, the racial slur on the mirror. And to try and throw detectives or whoever off. Now, who else would do that? When's the last time you heard, and I said this to the jury, somebody coming to a home to commit a burglary and robbery, they kill somebody, then they drag them, clean them up, put them in the bathtub, write a slur, and, and then leave. It, it just doesn't happen. And and when, just for, for people, I want to be clear, we're not going to repeat that slur, right, but... No. Uh, McNeil is African American, right? And it was a slur was against a slur. Yeah. against him, as as we call it, the N word, and that's the why I don't like to say say it either. No, but it absolutely was a, not. Another way to throw it off. Okay, whoever killed her, maybe it was a hate crime because she was married to an African American. Hmm, maybe that'll work. So he's got doing all these things. You got to understand, he's a probation officer, has a college education, very sophisticated. That makes him scary too. Um, but I had a detective and we had, uh, the expert on a witness stand and we took his writing and guess what? It matched. It matched his handwriting. So you piece all these pieces of circumstantial evidence together. And somebody said, I think the defense attorney, well, you know, fingerprints, uh, you know, blood, um, he lived there. I mean, that's not going to really do anything to help anybody. Um, so I think the defense really hung their whole the the whole defense on the timeline, uh, which which I understand. But um, he had more than enough time, and we had more than enough evidence. Um, and to this day, uh, I believe we did, and so have the appellate courts. Um, and many times, even the appellate courts that heard the habeas corpus proceedings when he blamed his brother for this. Um, the, the evidence is there. There's no doubt in my mind. 
and he continues to manipulate uh, manipulate uh, other um, organizations, the Innocence mm-hmm. Project, which they do a good job in some cases. Don't get me wrong. But he is such a manipulator. That's what occurred, and that's what frustrated me. And thank God for Chantel, because in a lot of these cases, they fall through the cracks. Uh, as a retired DA, I stayed with it through the appeals process. I made sure we had people ready to go if there was a parole hearing. And then I thought, no, I, this is one of those cases. There's there's a hand, just a handful that I want to stay with, you know, uh, to make sure he doesn't come out, not only t- to do justice for the victims, but to make sure he doesn't commit this crime again, because that's the type of sophistication and mentality uh, this defendant has. Mike, can you tell us about how uh, Deborah's body was posed? Because I I know your theory is you think that he was about to maybe clean her up or maybe move her, but describe how she was in the bathtub because, I mean, that further confused the investigation. Right. She was in the bathtub and it it was a a terrible, terrible crime scene. You know, she's laying in the bathtub or her head is shaven. Uh, We know the water contained... uh, Clorox and other cleaning items, and it it was, uh, we believe, and and circumstantially in the detectives, that it was an attempt to clean her up, um, to get any uh, any, um, evidence that would put him, you know, strangling her and him stabbing her uh, and using those type of um, detergents and cleaning items to... to, um, put her in the bathtub. And, and, and again, I think it goes to another layer of his anger and passion, uh, you know, to the way he positioned her. Um, and I, I'm not sure, you know, he's the only one that can answer that question. You know, why is it you did that to your own wife? She uh, had like a hamper on top of her. She was leaning forward and she had right. Right, like a clothes hamper on top of right. her, and then there was, uh, did I read like something like a penny jar or something? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Again, an attempt to, uh, we believe, to make it look like a, a, a robbery, you know, a burglary of the home, but doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense at all that somebody that's burglarizing a home is going to continue to burglarize after the fact that you kill a victim and you drag them and you drag them to the bathtub and you shave their half their head and you, and then you continue to burglarize and put the, the hamper on and, and, and the pennies. Um, yeah. It, uh, it, uh, a, a totally, um, the crime scene was totally again, fabricated, uh, to try and get him off. Mike, I, I want to ask you, Mr. McNeil was pretty adamant about attempting to lift uh, Deborah out of the tub, and he was unable to do that. Um, was that to explain why he couldn't do it? Or, I mean, I mean, he didn't, you found the hamper and the pennies still on top of him. He didn't even remove those to try to get to her. Is it even possible to attempt to pick her up without any type of transfer at all? That's ridiculous. I mean, he he could have tried to pick her up. She was not a big lady. Chantel will tell you, um, she was petite. Even in in, in the, the six months that you know she was pregnant, he could have lifted the others off. But we never really got the opportunity, of course, to he didn't take the stand to cross examine him or even to uh, talk to him after he made his initial statements. So um, no, that that. Uh, there, there's no way around that. Now, you you indicated it right. If that's my wife, that's the first thing I want to do is go to her and and hold her. And um, it just it just that his his story fabrication does not make sense. With the history of domestic violence uh, at that residence, uh, was there a, a was he ever arrested for previous domestic violence? And if so, did any of that affect his job at the probation office? You know, the sad thing is, I don't believe that he was ever charged. He may have been arrested. I know there was a point where they took the guns out of the residence. 
Um, and um, he always had a, uh, a, a way out uh, verbally, you know, about getting out of uh, some of the prior domestic violence incidents, uh, blaming the victim on some of those incidents, even continuing to do that. I don't know, if Chantel, you caught that in that long parole hearing that he understood about domestic violence and he agreed that he didn't handle his anger right. But I still felt at times that he was bl blaming Deborah for some of those incidents, the domestic violence incidents, um, typical of, of your domestic violence uh, folks that do that. But yeah, they're, they're uh, uh, and, and again, um, I'm not sure how much uh, the probation department knew about his background. Yeah, to this day. Chantel, you shared with me, you know, you're young at the time. You're very young. By the time the funeral, you know, comes along, you shared with me that he didn't show an awful lot of emotion, but his brother, who he now blames for the murder, was, you know, very emotional. Can you describe to us what that was like, what was going on? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, at during my mother's funeral, you know, we had to have a closed casket uh, based on the severity of her decomposition and the state of her body, uh, which already is, is hard for a child to try to um, go through the parts of grieving without being able to see their mother to say their final goodbyes. But in the meantime, we were in the front row Patrick was sitting in the back. He had his hands on his face like this. There were no tears. Um, he's sitting in the back with his brother, and Jeff is crying, showing true forms of emotion during the time. We, uh, my mother got buried in Rapid City, South Dakota, and uh, on the reservation, Pine Ridge. And it's more of a family type of funeral where you literally – will be the pallbearers and you dig up the grave and place your loved one down and, 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 and bury them. He did not at one moment lift one finger to help bury my mother and his unborn daughter to put them in their final resting place. His more concern was to tell my family that he has a gun on him and uh, that to, to just kind of be distant with the family, which which for for them, they knew immediately he had something to do with this. This is your wife. This is your, your child. You were young. At this point, do you believe, are you thinking, oh my God, did he really kill my mom? What, what did your gut tell you, even though you were very young at the time? Originally, it was, uh, I hoped, I hoped it wasn't him. I we knew my mother was coming back, so we all were just ecstatic, happy children. Like, yay, we're going to have our mom back. Finally, no more Patrick. Yay. Like, we're really excited about this. And literally a day later, we get our world ripped from underneath us because now our mother is gone. My initial, my initial fear was that my brother Marcus was also uh, murdered. Uh, at that time, he was in school. So once we got the word that he was safe with his father and going to be picked up and taken to Georgia, uh, that's when it really set in like, oh, my God, he did this. Like he did this. Uh, the the domestic violence incidents that I was there to witness uh, just kind of just slowly culminated to this moment. Like my mother, she was a churchly woman, always had faith tried her hardest to make her relationship work. And Patrick just was extremely cold, distant to us. He, he never, I don't have any memories with him, even though my mother moved into to their, their house in Highland whenever I would visit during track breaks. He was distant, he was gone working out. My mom had to take care of his children and, um, I remember when she was sick, my mother was always sick with bronchitis. And even through her pregnancy, she was sick with bronchitis. He, his, his daughter got sick and he forced her to, to clean it up. I, I remember I told him, like, why are you not rubbing the feet of your pregnant wife and helping, helping her? She's sick right now. And he just looked at me crazy and left to go to the gym. <laughs> like, 
little things like that. And uh, he destroyed all of my mother's, uh, well, because we're Native American, my father was really, really uh, talented with bone work. So he would make bone knives, bone uh, artifacts, and uh, lots of ceremony outfits. Well, we had a lot of these. My, my grandfather had passed away a few years prior. And uh, over an altercation that they had over money, um, he decided to completely destroy these heirlooms. And um, at that point, my mother was, every time I would see her, she's always crying, always sad, just feeling as though there was no no light. Like she couldn't get away from him. He had control over everything. The finances, the cars. There was two cars in their household. And he made sure not to give her any money so her car would be on E, which is strange to me because I never understood why my mom couldn't just drive herself that day to the doctor's appointment. But right. again, that's the control thing. That's the control. He needed to know where she is, how she is, and uh, it, it just, once he, once he took my mother away, I knew it was him. I knew it was him. And it hurt. I felt hopeless because I'm only 13. Like, what can I do? <laughs> what can I do? I'm 13. Oh, but you grew up to do it all. Yeah. <laughs> you, you did. You really did. You, you have grown up to truly be fierce. Fierce, fierce, fierce. You accomplished, you know, I always say that ordinary people doing extraordinary things because they're forced to. Because you were forced to. So you did. You absolutely did. I, I, I do, you know, in, in his parole hearing, and we're going to get to that in a little bit, um, he admitted to the domestic violence. And he even said at one point he took your mother and he bashed her head against a window because he was frustrated with her. You know, very matter of fact. You know, so that that's the level of violence that even to this day he, he still admits. I, I, I want to get now to the conviction. So this is a jury trial, Mike. Yeah. And you get the conviction. The sentences, because it's for two murders. Two murders. And, and um, I'm so glad as a human being that you yeah. went for, you know, the defense of yeah. two lives, not just one. Yeah. Um, so what was your understanding as far as how long he was going to be away sure. for? Sure, and we argued that, and uh, I made it very clear to when when I argued to the jury, don't forget there were two murders here. We got one count murder of Deborah and the child, uh, and um, one of the toughest moments in in a jury trial is you got to make sure the jury understands this was a human life, and uh, there was a photo. I don't know if Chantel saw this ever, but there was a photo uh, at the um, the coroner's office uh, of the baby on uh, on the table at the coroner's office, and, and I reminded the jury, uh, "I'm going to tell you why I'm telling this story in a second. That this is the second life." And I did my research because there was a timeline when you can charge somebody for murdering two depending on the uh, time that they're pregnant. I, I remember it was after the second trimester, and I don't exactly remember the, the time period, but in this case, we could uh, file two murders. And I said, absolutely, we are. And I did that because once we gave the evidence to the jury, uh, and that was in my last statement, don't forget the second victim, I wanted that in the judge's head. Because once the conviction came, and the jury did a, a heck of a job, they spent uh, eight days deliberating. They looked at everything, um, and uh, all of the they, they they actually did a, did a wonderful job to make sure that what they did was the right thing. And so you go to the sentencing date, and my concern was that the judge would con. con you know, sentence them um, concurrently, meaning together, only giving them 15 to life for two victims. 
Um, but I think the judge really understood, and I argued at sentencing too, that there, there are two victims. So he gave them consecutive terms, meaning 15 to life for Deborah and 15 to life for baby McNeil, which was absolutely appropriate for a total of 30 years to life. Um, and uh, so he, he shouldn't have been eligible at all for a parole hearing for years. Until 2030. Until 2030, uh, when Governor Newsom commuted a sentence, which... No, no, in 20... Oh, right. He would have right. been... He, he would no, have... he would have been. Yeah. And then Governor Newsom then, as we know, commuted a sentence. And then he was eligible for parole. And that's when Chantel went to work. God bless her. Because um, I don't believe without Chantel's work and what she did to pull everybody together, including me, that we would be talking today about this. He would be out. I truly believe that because I've, I've, I've handled many parole hearings. Uh, to this day, I, I stay involved, even retired with some of the murder cases that I handled. And you, you just, it, it takes, you hear this all the time. I hate to use the term, it takes a village. But in this case, oh my God, um, what Chantel did for her mother it was absolutely amazing. And it allowed us to really let the board of parole know what happened. And then it got us an opportunity. She didn't stop there. We talked to the governor's attorneys and governor's staff after the split parole hearing. And uh, we, we laid into them. Here's what really happened. Not what the Innocence Project's telling. You. Let's uh, let's get into the Innocence Project, so we sure. can. I always find that when we tell these cases in a chronological yeah. order, it it helps the listener or the viewer understand. So you know, everyone's thinking now, McNeil is going to be away for at least thirty years. All is quiet. Right. Then, around two thousand and six, the California Innocence Project gets involved and decides that there is credible evidence in their mind. The McNeil didn't do it and that maybe his brother did. Right. So what's interesting is when you actually Google Rodney Patrick McNeil, the first photo and the first um, website that comes up is um, a graduation photo of him in his cap and gown, very innocent yeah. looking, yeah. and the California Innocence Project. Just right. I'm just noting that. So... The Innocence Project claims that McNeil was wrongly convicted, and they say that at the time of the murder, he was at work because there were six calls that were made from his office phone to the house over the period of just a few minutes. Again, we've been through the timeline. We're not right. going to go through that again. So then in July of 2006, the California Innocence Project petitions the court with this new evidence, and this new evidence is that they claim that McNeil's half-brother, Jeff West, allegedly confessed to other people that he is the one who really killed Deborah, and they put them on the stand. The judge doesn't find them particularly credible. Uh, and one of them is actually a half-sister of the two of them. Um, what I w want to talk about about the Innocence Project here is he was considered one of the California 12. Lewis, you have worked for the Innocence Project. You have helped in these exoneration cases, look, we know that there are people who have been wrongly sure. convicted of murder. We know that. And they are getting released, you know, rather frequently. And DNA evidence is a lot that goes to the exoneration of these cases. I think we all respect that. And the Innocence Project has overall has a very noble cause. This one's interesting because the California Innocence Project failed at proving their argument that he was wrongly convicted. The courts did not agree with him. And really, the only evidence they had were uh, a few people who had changed their stories. And the judge at the time said, you look, your stories aren't credible because you basically changed your stories from before. Like there wasn't, I was waiting for that aha moment, the DNA, the, the um, you know, the police report that had been hidden from um, the defense, you know, I was looking for those kinds of things, which are usually what change cases. There wasn't any of that. Lewis, explain to me the significance, because I think this plays into why the governor did what he did, the significance and the power of the Innocence Project taking on a case. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so full disclosure, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in, in organizations like the Innocence Project, and I've done a ton of work with them, our firm has, in the past 10 years. And and we've been very successful in exonerating people that absolutely met the threshold, the Innocence Project's threshold, of discovering new evidence, new factual evidence, something that's never been presented before, that if you look at it, it's black and white, that person did not do it. And they've been exonerated 10, 20, 30 years incarcerated for something that, something they didn't do. We've been involved in those type of cases. And the individuals that I've worked with at the Innocence Project, the Southern California Innocence Project, probably the same folks involved in this, um, I have nothing but the highest respect for them. I never, ever, ever looked into this case. Uh, I helped them with other cases, with other members of the California 12. In fact, I think I sent you a picture, Anna, of me at their march uh, uh cheering them on with Rodney McNeil's uh, poster and banner behind me. Uh, didn't know anything about his case, but his banner was shoved back there. Don't know anything about it. I know now. Um, so I, I'm not sure. And I'll, to, to get on their threshold, they get 150,000 applications minimally a year um, uh, from people claiming that uh, they have to be incarcerated to qualify for one of their applications. Uh, and to pin it down to some case that they're going to narrow down to 12 cases, they're picking their best 12 cases, their best. So I find it really interesting because as we talked about, Mike mentioned earlier, the new evidence in, you know, with uh, the brother having the MO of doing this and McNeil's own brother uh, of committing homicide, not only that, but placing his victims in the tub, right? That's compelling. We just look at it from the outside. Wow. I, I have to at least look at that. Can't ignore it. Um, so I, you know, it, it's everybody's human. I don't know, but I could, I, I can say the same thing about law enforcement. We've worked cases, right? And where you know better than anybody, Anna, where we've gone to prosecutors' offices and we've been able to present evidence that not only exonerated the individuals that are wrongfully convicted or uh, arrested or in the process of being prosecuted, but led to the eventual arrest of the two suspects. Um, so there's, it's, they're incredible organizations and there's a necessity for them. Statistically, in the United States, we, and this is from innocent type organizations that, that uh, had it over these, these type of stats, but two to 10% of everybody who's incarcerated in the US are potentially innocent. They're, they've been uh, in prison unjustifiably and should have never happened. And that's just the stats in the last 10 years. It keeps growing. If, and if you keep watching the news, it happens and happens and happens more and more. Um, so I think that whole wave of this thing pushing forward could have been part of this, right? And could have been part of the momentum to, to for the governor to get on the rah-rah with that. I, I don't know. I don't have enough information on that. But it's it's really phenomenal, the work they do. But this one, I I haven't seen new evidence. And right. everything is seems to be easily explained away. Yeah. So, Chantel, I know you have some very strong feelings about the Innocence Project, how they handled this particular case. And I want to hear you out on it because, you know, you have a very valid uh, point of view, one that rarely gets addressed when someone is and not here. He hasn't been exonerated. But if someone's about to be exonerated or is exonerated, then, you know, that leaves the family of the victim saying, hold on a second. Then what the heck happened? So so share with us what your frustration has been. Yeah. Um, once we got the hearing of the two counts of 15 to 30, uh, that's where us as her children should have been able to start our, on, on our healing process. I honestly was trying to navigate through my childhood, my teenage years. So I wasn't researching every day on Rodney. Uh, it just so happened in 2014 that I, you know, just for the sake of looking, decided to search online. And I saw that the California Innocence Project had taken him up as a client. Now, that was seven years after they had already taken him up as a client. Uh, it ended up being me that reached out to them in 2014 uh, to find out you know, why, what was their decision on choosing him as a client and how come they never reached out to the victim's family. At that point, uh, they said that they had uh, talked to all the people in the trial, and I had to stop them at that point and let them know, like, well, you're looking at two people who are not only the children of the victim, but were also in the trial. 
that you didn't speak to at all. You didn't attempt to contact us. At that, from there, at the end of our meeting, they said, at this point, we've already invested too much in Rodney's story, so we kind of have to just ride with it, got to roll with it. And I felt highly defeated because this is a huge media corporation that has this backing behind them, and I'm just one person. And afterwards, they did reach for, they tried to attempt to do a clemency with the previous governor, Governor uh, Jerry Brown Jr. Uh, at that point, I did send a letter to him stating, you know, I'm, I'm the daughter's, I'm, I'm the victim's daughter. Please hear my story. Please, please deny the clemency. He, I truly feel like with my letter, it did help the governor with his decision of denying the clemency. Uh, from there, once uh, the commuted sentence happened, I, my mother's friend, uh, who was also in the trial, who Patrick, or I call him Patrick, but Rodney, uh, tried to put the blame on, uh, she found me and she said that uh, the California Innocence Project uh, also did not reach out to her until 2016. Now, this was two years after my initial meeting with the California Innocence Project. I actually have that letter that, uh, of them reaching out. So on top of that, the California Innocence Project got involved when Rodney tried to be on a TV show called Reasonable Doubt. And um, the ball was rolling for that TV show to take place. Uh, it wasn't me that initiated it. It was his uh, girlfriend at the time. And uh, they came back to me and said, uh, Reasonable Doubt stated that they could no longer go forward with the show because the California Innocence Project pretty much gave them an ultimatum. If you do this show, we are going to drop you as a client at that. So that unfortunately, in regards to the California Innocence Project, even with my change.org petition, I got about 2,000 signatures and they blocked me. Uh, so there, as much as I love the Cal, I think what the California Innocence Project stands for and what they can do and have done for people who are truly innocent, unfortunately, they dropped the ball with this case. Completely. And and that's why I find this whole case so fascinating, you know, because you've got some very powerful organizations involved here. I mean, the California Innocence Project, again, doesn't take that many cases. And they did take this one, which makes everyone stand up and wonder. Well, as you said, the California Innocence Project never really gave up. They they were Mike, they 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 reached their limit on appeals, right? All denied. So that's right. not going to work. Then they right. try approaching the governors. And I, I didn't know they had tried um, Jerry Brown. So they're not done yet. Now we're going to move to March 2020, approximately a year ago. This is when the drama starts all over again. The California Innocence Project presents three cases that they're working on to California Governor Newsom for commutation. And one of them is McNeil's. Right. Okay. Now, at the time that the governor is deciding these cases, look, there are probably a lot of nonviolent offenders out there who have done good things with their time in prison, and they probably do deserve to be let out early or be recognized in some way. I'm not denying that. Remember, I said nonviolent offenders. That, that to me, is right. very key here. Okay, so the governor declares, quote, that McNeil has, quote, committed himself to self-improvement. And then the governor commutes his sentence along with 20 other sentences, in part because of the pandemic. He's got to get people out of the prisons. He's got a, another issue again. I, I, I'm hearing part of that. So, Mike, explain to me what commuting a sentence means. That doesn't mean you're automatically released. It means that you are what now you have a, a um, special yeah. uh, ability to to maybe be released. How does that work? Yeah. So commuting a sentence means you are now eligible to be released as soon as governor did the commutation. So you don't have to wait the 30 years anymore, and you're eligible. Now, if you are in for a murder and you have, uh, like, especially a live tail, you still have to have a parole hearing. 
But most of the time, if a governor commutes somebody's sentence, it goes to a parole hearing. It's almost like a rubber stamp. Bam. We're not going to go against the governor that appoints us to the parole board. Um, this person is going to be out. And we were up against that. And, uh, you know, in trying to prepare Chantel and the family, uh, along with the, the deputy DA from the, the DA's office that attended the hearing, this is rare. Um, but we can fight. We can fight this. And Chantel got her family members and other tribal members and myself and other people at that parole hearing. We just went to war because we wanted to tell the parole hearing what I truly believe. And I believe this. The governor didn't know. Um, he was given information by his staff and the Innocence Project, uh, et cetera. Um, I, I could be wrong. I'm not sure if the governor went back and read transcripts from an appeals court. Well, you know, maybe he that. should. I'm sorry. He should But no, I no, read no. the 215 pages of the right. parole board hearing. If I can do it, I think the governor can do it, you know. I, I totally agree with you. And in fact, on uh, Twitter and social media, I went to war with the governor. How can you do this? I had DAs from across the state contacting me. Mike, didn't you try this case? Yes. Um, this is this is just an example of what's happening with all parole hearings for lifers uh, and those that have committed murder. We're like in shock. And this was one of those cases where everybody was like shocked, like, how could he do this? Um, and how could he do it to the victims? And what about the danger to the community, et cetera, especially in San Bernardino County? People knew this case. They knew he was a probation officer, and he murdered not one but two. Uh, and that's what I had to keep reminding uh, people. And so we were gearing up, and I made sure the DA's office uh, was going to have a, an attorney there at the parole hearing. I was talking to Chantel, uh, and um, I was able to come on at the parole hearing. But interestingly enough, the parole board wouldn't let me talk about the facts of the case. I read that. Well, I was like, they yeah. shut you down. They said, they, well, you're yeah. here to support the family. I'm, I was just there as a victim advocate, which I was happy to do. Right. But it was interesting to me that I was blocked from talking about any of the facts that we talked about today. How ridiculous is that? I mean, just as a regular person, to me, this sounds yeah. like that is ridiculous. Chantel, before we get into the details of this parole hearing, uh, when you heard... When you found out first, how did you find out that the governor had commuted his sentence? And was this like a dagger in the heart? Yeah, it was um it was two days before my birthday. Oh <laughs> no, not March, again. Again, I know, I swear, like it was March twenty seventh. Uh, an hour before the news articles dropped, I got a call from victim services in California. And they had let me know, hey, just wanted to let you know that the governor commuted his sentence. So you're going to be reading about this in about an hour. Oh, my God. It was like an uh, old wound got reopened once again. Because I've never, I've, I've never had a moment to just heal from this. Because every year there's something and something different. And at that point, I panicked. I panicked. I'm like, oh, my gosh, who do I call? Who do I call? And uh, I, I got a hold of Mike Ramos. And he gave me the number to the current District Attorney of San Bernardino, Jason Anderson. And I spoke to his uh, PR, Mike Byers, and he gave me the number to number to the governor. At that point, I had called the governor because I wanted to see, you know, hey, governor, like, this is my livelihood, my safety. Like, I have to now prepare to look behind me whenever I'm walking in the future because there's no guarantee that this man might have a vendetta out for me because of how hard I've been fighting throughout these years. I didn't get any response from him. And so I, I had to figure out a way to be heard. And that was what started my journey with the changed out Care petition because, uh, oh my God, like, <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one that experienced that with these commuted sentences. Uh, of course get, not. To get, of no course not. get notified an hour before. Oh, 
Horrible. Okay, so let's now, I, and again, I, I, I'm just so impressed with your ability to organize. You did the online petition. You gathered all these letters from all the different tribes in support of your mother and legislators and your whole family. And then comes the day, September 3rd now of 2020, not that long ago, the parole board has a hearing. It's done virtually. Mm -hmm. Chantel, you are there, your family members, nieces, aunts, um, siblings, Mike, you're there, not allowed to really speak much, but nonetheless, right. Right. <laughs> you're there. The DA is represented. And um, what's interesting is, as I was reading the transcript, and again, it's like, the more the public knows, the more we understand about our system, and what's what is what works and what doesn't, you know, the parole board made it very clear, you know, we are not going to retry the case. Nonetheless, they did challenge a lot of the evidence and they they questioned McNeil a lot. And this is when McNeil goes on about and just to give you some perspective, OK, he's now been in prison because he's been he's been jailed since he was arrested. And then, of course, he was convicted in 2000. So for 23 years, he's been behind bars. He when he was arrested, he was 27 years old. And when the parole board took this up, he was 50. Just gives you perspective, you know. And I'm not saying by any means that that's enough. I'm just saying, you know, perspective of what's going on. And according to the transcripts, they, you know, they go into how he tells the par parole board that he started stealing at an early age. He admits that he was a criminal. He says he was encouraged and directed by his mother. He describes how he was brought up. It was terrible. He admits, he says, to the domestic violence. He admits to when he was a parole officer that he was committing insurance fraud, that he was buying stolen property and knew it. And it's like, it's, it's amazing because basically here you have a member of law enforcement or probation officer right. who is admitting to all this criminal activity pretty much his whole life, including during his career. I mean, Lewis, how offensive is this? Oh, it hurts. It's embarrassing on so many levels. Um, so, <sighs> Yeah, but not the first time we've heard that scenario. I mean, uh, no. we still see that pop in its head every once in a while. And when they get mm -hmm. smacked down, it's beautiful. It's just. Uh, oh, and here's yeah. the other thing that came out. So remember how the governor had said when he commuted him, it's like, oh, he's really improved his self-improvement. He's really been working on himself. I know I'm paraphrasing there. Well, he admits that he's been selling drugs, heroin yeah. in the prison to make money. Of course, yeah. he says it was his cellmate's idea. You know, that's not my fault. But nonetheless, he admits to doing that. So I'm thinking to myself, as I'm reading this, Mike, as I'm reading this, I'm 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 thinking, where is the self-improvement part? What what exactly has changed here? Well, he and, didn't bl he didn't blame it on his brother. <laughs> oh, he well, <laughs> no, he didn't. But the heroin sale right. in prison, he did not blame on his brother. But the murder. He clearly did. Yeah. And he went on and on and on about how it really was his brother. It wasn't him. OK, so Mike, Chantel, you were there. Chantel, from your perspective, what was this parole board hearing like? Well, I definitely would not recommend doing a parole hearing over Zoom. Mm. It completely took away the, the moment of healing that a victim needs to be able to confront the first, the perpetrator. Uh, also, the one of the parole board members almost seemed uninterested. Like, and, and it was very frustrating because it, it ended up taking about eight hours, which was I couldn't believe. <laughs> so, but for for him to to see his face and recognize that he's not paying attention and he's already made his mind up. It almost felt like I was talking to a brick wall. And it was frustrating to me because in my mind, I wanted to look Patrick in his face and let him know that he did not murder or completely get rid of my mother's spirit because she lives in me. And the truth is going to be out because my truth has never changed. Although his has, mine never has. I, was, I appreciate the fact that uh, board member Lamb, she was more empathetic to listening to all sides. And when she cross-questioned him or cross-examined him, 
uh, she, she could read right through it, right through his lies. And so for you being in prison for 23 years, how much have you learned? Like you, you just found a different way of redirecting, like by putting in the blame on now his brother. So a third, fourth story, third, fourth story, and you're minimizing the domestic violence by trying to make himself look like the hero of trying to save Deborah from herself. And I wanted to promote his book. And so I'm like, are you, are you recognizing this? Like, I think what was interesting to me was the fact that during the hearing, unfortunately, you can't see the video, but I had a, my mother's photo behind me and her, her, her tribal sundra, uh, her tribal dress with me. And it spoke to him. It really did. Uh, as soon as I, my camera got turned on, he was like, he was shocked. And um, I think that might have helped a little bit in uh, shaking down the story. I think it's, I, I'm sorry, Louis. I, I just want to say, I think it's so wrong that these things are not made public, honestly. Because if you hadn't sent us the transcript, I was on the website this week trying to find because I, I just wanted to make sure I understood because there were two votes based on this parole board hearing. There was a tie. There was a tie. This this board tied on what to do. So then it went like the following month in October, it went to the full per, 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 excuse me, it went to the full parole board for a full vote. And then they voted to release McNeil. But what I'm advocating for is where is the transparency? Why why can't I find this on the website? Why? Why isn't the video of this available to the public? I want to see his face. I want to see your face. I want to make my own decisions. I have a right as a citizen of this state to know what the hell is going on at the parole board. Uh, and I'm sorry, Lewis, I just need to get oh, that no, out. Forgive no, me. No, no, makes sense. Those are all powerful, more than reasonable points. Chantal, I just, I just want to say, uh, it, I think it's amazing. You brought up a great point that you conducted this old parole hearing on Zoom. No, we forget. It just desensitizes the victims um, at a level that's never been seen before. And you have to wonder how many of these Zoom parole hearings that were on the fence, on the cuff, uh, went one way because it were if the family in the in the parole hearing, they would have been in that room, would have made a difference. Having the board members, having to see the family, having Mr. McNeil, having to see the family, having to see you. If your mom's rest in the background made a difference, if you're feeling that might have, have made something positive and, and made him take, uh, become aware of it. Imagine having the family in there. It's just, it's, things get lost in the Zoom world. It's horrible. And I don't know how it affected this, but wow. Well, mm. So Mike, the, as yeah. we said, this one tied yeah. and then it went to the full board, sure. which said, sure, let's release him. He's not a danger to society. Uh, this is what they cited the, on, on October 20th. They granted parole citing he does not pose a risk or danger. Those are their words. Mm -hmm. All right. So now it is the end of October. You guys have got to be really scared at this point because honestly, he's about to be released. Right. Right. Yeah. I uh, received a uh, letter uh, that said that his tentative release date was November 13th, which terrified me. I'm like, hold on. Like, I thought that uh, because uh, I'm. I'm not familiar with law or any of those things. I had to start looking up all of these words for the First Amendment rights and statute of limitations and and uh, protocols of being able to appeal a a granted parole. I had no idea. So uh, it, for it to be less than 30 days, and it says for California, it's up to 120 days. I was terrified. Absolutely. So, Mike, what what then changed? Because yeah. ultimately the governor reverses himself um, at the end of January, which we'll get to. But in this time period from the end of October until the end of January, as far as you all are concerned and the public is concerned, he's about to be released. That's true. He's about to be released. And, and you know, back to what we were saying earlier, just having a Zoom meeting for parole hearings is just terrible for victims and their families. I, I agree with that. But now that this has happened, 
Um, I have to give credit to the deputy district attorney, Connie Lasky, over the life or parole unit, which I created in 2003 because of cases like this. We, we didn't have anybody at the parole hearings. I thought, we're going to have a deputy DA there from now on with victims and their families because when that person, you can look them in the eye and look at the board members in the eye. That makes a big difference than having a Zoom meeting. But fast forward now. Now the full board is saying he's going to be paroled. We didn't quit, you know. And uh, what do we need to do next? We need to write letters. We need to get people. I met people I would have never met uh, in my life from uh, the tribal nations in uh, Dakota and, you know, talking to one of the, I believe was a Senator Chantel. Uh, and we talked yeah. about what we need to do and how can we get a hold of the governor. I think, I think, I know that grabbed the governor's attention because of what's going on in the world with, with a native American women and, and domestic violence and whatnot. That was key to get the attention. And then to know that we had a meeting with the governor's staff and governor's attorney, I told Chantel, this is huge. I mean, because Chantel was emailing with them and they were, okay, let me take a look at it. And then a scheduled meeting, even though it was Zoom, I go, well, this is rare. This is our opportunity to give them our side and what, what occurred and what happened. And the uh, governor was not part of that, no, that meeting. The governor okay. was not there. The governor was too busy, of course, but. Commuting. You know, <laughs> commuting yeah, sentences. Yeah, community sentences and other sentences that uh, it's another story. But so I, we gave a, our best effort. I believe that uh, we made an impression because the governor's sta staff uh, emailed me back, Chantel back. Here's what the step is. We're going to get this information to the governor. And finally, I believe the governor got the true facts what really he should have done in the beginning when done his homework which he did not as we discussed earlier and when he reviewed what they had said and what we had you know told him uh and his findings were that you know mcneil's still a danger he is a danger and reversed himself because he had to reverse himself to reverse the board and um, I'll never forget when Chantel, God bless her, she knew before I did. And, and I was shocked. I, I, I didn't want to tell Chantel to get her hopes up because I didn't think this would ever happen with Governor Newsom. And this and was the only way to stop that, McNeil from it. being he, released he was, was the governor. Out. He was getting, yeah, yes, the governor. He's the only one that could reverse them. Amazing. And when that happened, it was a great day. Great oh. day for not only Chantal and her family, victims across America. And, you know, when you commit a murder, you commit two murders, uh, you should be held responsible. It shouldn't be up to a political position, a governor, to be able to reverse um, what everybody has done months, days, years to make sure justice was done. And so um, I, still, you know, when I read, when I read uh, the governor's report, it, it, yeah. it still is, it's great. Yeah. It, yeah. And, 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 you know, Lewis and I were on the phone with Chantel. It was yeah. a Friday and, and yeah. Chantel is like, she gets off. The, she says, you got to hold on. <laughs> and so Lewis and I are still, you know, talking about the case. And she's like, Something's changing. I think they're going to be releasing something Monday. And I was, we're on yeah. the phone on a Friday. And Monday, yeah. she says, I think we're going to hear. And I think it may be good. A yeah. And we were committed to doing this episode no matter what. No right. matter what. Because really, this is an incredible case, especially when you, you look at the totality of the case. Yeah. Right? So then on January 29th, two months ago, the governor reverses himself saying, quote, I have considered the evidence in the record that is relevant to whether Mr. McNeil is currently dangerous. Mm -hmm. When considered as a whole, I find the evidence shows that he currently poses an unreasonable danger to society if released from prison at this time. While I commend Mr. McNeil for his efforts, I don't know what efforts, I find that he is unsuitable for parole at this time. 
Yeah. And not one fact, not one fact in this case had changed from the day he commuted the sentence Correct. and then reversed himself. Nothing. Chantel, describe to us what that was like. Oh, my gosh. Um, a bit of relief. <laughs> like, um, to, to be able to organize such a movement with the domestic violent advocates and the missing and murdered Indigenous women advocates and with Tamara St. John, she's a state rep legislator in South, South Dakota. A lot of the tribal members, it was an undertaking for sure uh, to get all of these organizations together to recognize that this is the time that missing and murdered Indigenous women are just swept under the table. The, the numbers are uh, astonishing and for my mother to be an indigenous woman and for California Innocence Project to state that she was a white woman on the Liquid Films website to stoke any type of injustice that they might feel for uh, wrongly uh, convicted African-American men as Patrick was, it, it, it hurt my feelings and it, it frustrated me because I am also black, but I'm also indigenous. And my mother was an indigenous woman who had to live through that domestic violence. Uh, us, I consider us collateral victims because we never got an opportunity to heal. And time after time after time, we're just getting bombarded with legal limbo, like lingo, legal lingo that we have no idea about. We're just children. Like, so to, to, to recognize that with, with no funding, I was able to coordinate all these people and get over a thousand signatures on a change.org petition and to make the governor take a second look at this case and recognize that Patrick is very cunning and he will use whatever form that he can to get out. And he finally saw through his story and recognized that he definitely is still a danger. It was a relief. <laughs> I bet. And your petition is up to like 7,000. I saw it yesterday. I'm like, people are still signing your petition, making yes. sure that, you know, that, that the justice system remembers that there's a lot of pressure. People don't want them out there. But so you're you're safe and you have a victory. You have been heard. But now this whole thing is triggered. What 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 happens now, Mike? I mean, yeah. McNeil is going to come up when for parole again, like yeah. soon. Well, what happens, two things. What happens with McNeil is he'll have a parole hearing, but it'll be a parole hearing. Hopefully the pandemic's over where we can be there live. And I think that will happen. That's going to be a huge difference compared to being on Zoom. And uh, the one thing about having a deputy DA there, she can actually cross-examine him about facts when he brings up stuff about his brother or whatnot, and they have reviewed the file, et cetera. And, I'll, and uh, if not, I would attend that as well. Um, I think that, but, uh, and, and then Chantel and others will have the opportunity to be there live. But it's going to be a parole hearing, and they'll consider all the factors, and, and, and commutation won't be one of the things politically that they have to determine because no, now we're talking about a person that committed not one, but two murders. Secondly, I think the bigger picture we, we need to, to know, I think this sends a message, you know, out to, to everyone uh, about victims' rights and how some of the changes that need to be done that you discussed about parole hearings, they need to become transparent. They have all these bureaucratic rules, like you heard me. I couldn't even talk about the own case I tried. I was the DA at the time. Uh, there's only one person that can be there for the victim at the live parole hearings. Um, only so many family members. Um, it, it's the, all, the, all of this is, is all covered in secrecy. And there should be transcripts. There should be that the public can see because everything else is court proceedings, you know, uh, you know, appellate proceedings, anything else in the judicial system, the parole system needs to be shaken. And I hope what you do helps helps that with the bigger picture for everyone. 
I agree. Lewis, what do you think? Because I, honestly, I rarely covered any parole hearings. Well, I've never been to a parole hearing, right. but but rarely, again, unless it was a Manson family, nobody paid attention in the media. Yeah. Chantel, I just want to share with you, uh, when I went to the Sheriff's Academy back in early 80s, one of the best instructors I had, he his name was Oliver Thompson. And he phenomenal instructor. But one of the things that he said that sticks with me to this day, he asked an open question to the class, can one person affect change? And there was about 10 seconds of silence. No one dared answer. Um, and he said, of course, one person can affect change. Don't, don't ever forget it. And now as I look back, I think I can identify maybe a handful of people in my life will come across that affected big change. And you're one of them. Don't ever forget that. And he wasn't just talking about people in the justice system. Mm -hmm. Anybody can affect change. You did that. Know that if this rears its ugly head again, the work you've put, on, put in already is going to come to fruition. It's going to ring loud and clearer than before. And somebody out there is watching the work you're doing, thinking, should I go forward or not? And when they see what you've been able to, to accomplish, I think you're going to motivate people. And also, I, I applaud you for that. Um, and, and Mike, I got to tell you, um, I don't know. I, I, I applaud you because I don't know uh, of anybody else. The fact that you kept this close to the chest, you've got a few cases, you're in retirement now. You have the choice and the ability to walk away and just ignore it. You choose not to. Um, and you make everybody in the justice system or was in the justice system, you, you put a, a bright light on them. I mean, you make it, uh, it, you bring more credibility because that's passion. That's somebody that cares about true justice. So I thank you for that. Thank you. You two are so impressive. Uh, you know, the whole team, your whole family, because I know it's more than just the two of you, of course, your family. But I, I just, you know, I'll never forget your reaction when I wrote back to you on on <laughs> YouTube. And I'm like, what? What case is this? Wait a minute. I want to talk to you. And we moved it to DMs and then emails. And you were like, you read my my comment? I'm like, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, you actually read it. <laughs> yeah, not only did we read it, we were like, oh, this story has got to be told. This cannot be ignored. And I am glad that I have seen so much media coverage, both, you know, television and online coverage of this case. But the difference is, and the reason I love this program, is we can really go in depth and have those conversations about what was really going on and give you the whole picture. And it takes a long time to tell that story. But this case, I am just so relieved that we were able to still tell it and tell it with such frankness, because when you toss in the complication of the Innocence Project, getting into the mix here and, and putting their, their name and reputation behind McNeil, it really makes everyone step back and go, oh, gosh, well, what do they know? But so far, we haven't seen any new evidence. So I, I just, I, gosh, I'm just, I'm, I'm really pleased for you. You know, you work so hard for your mother and her honor and you, you're amazing. You're an amazing, amazing woman. Thank you. <laughs> Very true. And you know, it's for, for me, it's, it, yeah, one person, one person. I couldn't, uh, I, I didn't want to, I couldn't allow for him to, to get out so easily without taking ownership and accountability for his actions. He did murder my mother. He murdered her for the insurance policy. He committed domestic violence against her. The California Innocence Project decided to take away the fact that my mother was an indigenous woman and he is a probation officer. So he should be held at a higher level of accountability. The climate right now is just so extreme and a lot of people, a lot of victims feel like they're, they, they have no rights, there is no justice for them. And this story shows that Victims have rights too, and uh, it it takes one person to just say, "Okay, we we can do this. We can hold the justice. We can hold justice 
in your relative's name. Amazing. Thank you both for joining us and sharing so much detail, providing the documentation, providing the transparency and the transcript, which we couldn't get, right? God forbid the public should be open to to see these things. And Lewis, of course, um, always your insight into these cases and to helping me in the very beginning when I was overwhelmed and I was like, what does this mean? I don't understand. Um, so we always ask people if they uh, want to follow or get in touch with uh, everyone. For So, Mike, I know that you are doing some – you're not fully retired, Mike. No. <laughs> what no. are you up to these days? Well, currently I'm a, a co co -dir director at the University of California, Riverside and Law and Justice Studies Institute. I am the uh, program developer for the California District Attorneys Association Institute on research and justice. And I serve on the board of directors of the California Crime Victims Alliance. Um, and uh, I continue personally to push for a, a national victims rights amendment United States Constitution of America, and this would be part of it, the parole hearings, but uh, it keeps me busy. It's my passion, and um, I will continue to do that, and I will continue to, to really watch this case closely. Thank you for that. And Chantel, where can people find you or reach out to you and your efforts if they want to support or they find themselves victims as well and, and are looking to learn from you? Yeah, they can always go to www.change.org slash justice for Deborah Black Crow. I am uh, keeping that up to date with uh, the case as it progresses. I know that we are going to have a parole hearing here within the year. Uh, the good thing is that now we have the governor's word on our side instead of his side. Right. <laughs> but yes. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And Lewis, where can people find you if uh, they need a private investigator or they also are victims and need, need some help? Whatever it is we do, uh, you can find my entire social media footprint at getbitinvestigations.com. Thank you. All right. And you can always find me at Anna G News uh, on all social media. And um, I believe this episode is proof that I read your comments. I may not be able to get to all of them, but but um, I I do try and I do listen and I applaud the 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 chorus as I say the angry outraged chorus. You guys are amazing. You inspire me. Thank you so much. This is True Crime Daily, the podcast. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. As always, you can find our content wherever you get your podcast: Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube. Subscribe to our channel and also to our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. Until next time and next week, this is True Crime Daily, the podcast. I'm Anna Garcia, and as we always say, don't do crime. <laughs>